No, you're not late. Uh, it's okay. Just <laughs> very important. No. <laughs> um, so today we have three presentations. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the news of the week about black holes. Um, uh, there was a paper on the archive um, that uh, an intermediate mass black hole, a black hole with a mass of the order of 10,000 solar masses, uh, may exist near the galactic center, near Sagittarius A star. And uh, this is the fifth candidate in that vicinity. And uh, the way that people infer its possible existence is from the motion of gas in the vicinity. So we don't know if this is a black hole, but we just see gas moving very fast. Uh, and the, the, the amount of mass that is implied is 10,000 solar masses, much more than you find in stars or gas in that region. And so it's possible that there are five or more intermediate mass black holes <coughs> near the central black hole at the center of the Milky Way, which, if true, would be very interesting and exciting because uh, there are implications. I mean, where did these black holes come from? They could have come from the centers of globular clusters that fell in or dwarf galaxies. And then what does it mean for LISA uh, in terms of gravitational wave sources in our galaxy or in other galaxies? So. That's the news of this week. Uh, it's on the archive. And uh, we should start with the first presentation. OK. Uh, so the first speaker today is uh, Gaurav Khanna. He's a professor of physics at uh, UMass Dartmouth. Uh, he's been working on the high precision uh, numerical computations in gravity. And today he's going to tell us about observation signatures of near extreme curve black holes. Thank you, Fabio. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you all for coming. So first off, I'm a theorist. So when I say observational signatures, everybody should take that with a grain of salt. Okay. So I'll start with a quick outline of my talk. So the framework I'm going to be using is black hole perturbation theory, which I imagine everybody knows here means that the background space time is going to be fixed to that of a black hole. In my case, it's going to be a near extreme occur or extreme occur black hole. And we focus on only the dynamics of the perturbations uh, only. And in particular, what I'm going to be talking about is solving the Stefanski master equation for curved black holes with a background that is near extreme. The fields and signals that I'm interested in are going to be gravitational waves and scalar waves, and we'll be extracting this at null infinity. Um, and you'll notice that the emphasis in my talk is going to be on late time uh, signals, mm -hmm. which means the quasi-normal ringing and also the so-called price tails. If anybody has a question, please stop me anytime you want to. So a quick slide with some of the literature um, which is relevant to this. So most of the results that I'm talking about today come from these three papers that are listed right here. Two of these were published just last year in this sort of new PhysRev journal, PhysRev Research. Uh, and all of them are with my uh, long-term collaborator, Lior Burko, and also with two of my former students, Sabir uh, and Noor. I'd also like to make a special <coughs> acknowledgement to Stefano Saritakis, who's talked here before. Uh, he gave a lot of guidance on a certain part of the work that I'll get into a little bit later. Finally, I should list a bunch of other papers that were either inspiration or had key results that we found very useful. In particular, I want to mention work done by Andy's group over here that I use very critically going forward. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So uh, a quick slide about the computational setup. So as I said, we're going to be looking at the solution of the Tchaikovsky equation. In the time domain, that's going to be a bit different. Normally, you get to see the Tchaikovsky equation solved in frequency domain. And also, this is going to be a numerical solution. Um, and another unusual piece of this work is going to be the coordinates we use. So the art standard bohr Lindquist coordinates, they are these compactified hyperboloidal coordinates, which basically have slices that look like these over here. So near the black hole, it's going to pretty much be like whirling fish coordinates. But further out, you'll notice that they sort of change shape quite a bit. And in fact, these coordinates allow us to access null infinity on the computational grid itself, which is kind of a key piece to this calculation. We couldn't do what we're doing without some of that uh, element in there. And the compactification really helps with computational efficiency. And again, without the compactification, we really wouldn't have the precision results that we do have uh, in this numerical computation. 
Uh, a few other pieces here. The rest of it is actually fairly standard. So uh, you know, we because the background space time is is cylindrically symmetric, we remove the phi dependence, and uh, what we end up with is a system of two plus one dimensional <coughs> PDEs, and you can cast them in first order hyperbolic form, and then you can do finite differencing. We do sixth order finite differencing here. Another novel piece here is that we use GPU computing because it's very, very critical again for the high precision stuff we did. So that was actually a big benefit as well. Okay, okay so I'll jump into some physics now. Um, so imagine we have, we consider an extreme mass ratio in spiral, so which basically means you've got a black hole, in our case an extreme Lucar black hole or a near extreme Lucar black hole. And imagine you take a small particle, a small test particle, and you let it spiral into this black hole. That's the sort of scenario I'm looking at. So this type of work has been looked at <coughs> in the past, although not a lot. Uh, there's actually these two papers that I'm going to use multiple times. So there's this paper by uh, Young et al., which is uh, Young by Chen's group at Caltech. And of course, the paper I already mentioned, Andy's group here, that talk about this from a few years ago. And what they found are two unusual aspects, given the fact that the background space time is near extreme Volcar. So they find that the uh, overtones quasi-normal of the quasi-normal ranking get highly excited in these cases. And they stack on top of each other in a peculiar way that it looks like the ring down phase, the quasi-normal ranking amplitudes don't decay exponentially, they decay like a power law. This is like an optical illusion, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and in addition to that, the quasi-normal ringing that you see actually varies in frequency over the duration of the, of the ring down, which is also quite unusual. And again, this is an effect that shows up just because of stacking of overtones. If you wait long enough, of course, you'll be in, ending up with a single dominant quasi-normal mode, and you'll have an exponential decay and a fixed frequency. This is only a thing in the intermediate regime. Uh, but the cool thing is that you can make this intermediate regime as long as you want, based on how fast you're going, how fast the black hole's spinning. Yeah? Quasi normal modes are, are defined as modes which decay exponentially. So what does it mean that they decay exponentially? Yeah, so I'm not quite calling them modes. I'm calling it ring down for that reason, quasi normal ringing. It basically is the tail end of the signal which you get you know, from a process of the kind that I'm describing. So this is not a specific. So if you fix, so typically quasi normal modes are described by three parameters, L, M, and an overtone. So if you choose L, M, and N, of course you'll have a fixed you know, decay rate and a fixed exponential form. But if you fix L and M, then you sum over all the overtones typically. And what we're saying here is that if you sum up the overtones, then typically you get a behavior like this in this near extreme or type of context. Other questions? OK. So some results. So a few years ago, we tried to go ahead and test this very generically for these Emory-like systems. And so I'll take some time to explain this. So what you're looking at here basically are, uh, is the gravitational wave. Um, this is the 2-2 mode. So L and M are fixed to 2-2, the most dominant protopole mode, as a function of time on a uh, log linear scale. Okay? And this over here represents the ring down phase. So essentially from this point on, you see the ring down phase of a plunging uh, a particle into a black hole. And if you look at this case here, this is the sub-extremal case. So it basically has a spin of, uh, I can't quite read that too well, but this is sub-extremal, okay? And as you speed up the black hole, you're gonna get these waveforms over here, the amplitude varies uh, with a sort of a well-defined arc that appears. So the sub-extremal case, you can see you have a straight line on a linear log on a linear. Sorry, the, 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 the vertical the vertical axis is the logarithm of Log the amplitude, amplitude of the, of the gravitational wave. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you can basically so you get a straight line, which means you have a fixed uh, uh, fixed quasi-normal mode here, which you're picking up the most dominant one because you have an exponential decay in the amplitude. Uh, but as you speed up, as you have the black hole spin faster, <coughs> notice that you get, ultimately, the late stages, you still get a straight line, which means that you still have an exponential decay, of course, that emerges. But there's an intermediate regime over here in which you have a very distinct arc that's not quite a straight line exponential decay. So you can do some more analysis, and we do that over here. I won't get into it too much. But basically, what you can show is that this intermediate regime is, in fact, an inverse time power line. That's kind of very clear from this analysis. So this is exactly what I was saying earlier. The sum of the overtones gives you this effective behavior that doesn't look like an exponential decay. It looks like an inverse time type of decay. 
And this can potentially be an interesting signature for these type of black holes as, as LIGO and other detectors make, uh, make further Can I ask a question? Yeah. So does this have impact on the total energy extraction from the black hole in gravitational waves? In other words, if it's spinning very fast like this, would you expect a market increase? So essentially you would have, yeah, so if you look at the quasi-normal modes, there would be a larger portion of gravitational energy coming out on that side, on that, on, from that particular portion. How extreme does it need to be in order for this to be done? Yeah, so I was going to say that next. If you want to have this intermediate regime last, let's say, a few hundred or a few thousand M long, <coughs> then you need to have five nines basically, in your spin parameter. Do we expect so, that to exist in nature? So we probably don't, okay? So that's a disappointing part of this, which is if nature does find a way to create these, then these signals should be out there and we should be able to pick them up with LIGO or future detectors. How does something yeah. with, and presumably this could be computed in an, expan in an expansion in one over one minus A over M, how does it end up being so small? So, what what what? Oh, you mean this number over here? Where does yeah. it come from? The ten minus five. So I, all I can say is that numerically that's what we find, but that's I, I think would be a great question for people here perhaps to look at, which is why specifically that particular quantity. But uh, this is a numerical result what we found. So yeah. So your your numeric covered with a a grid of ten to the five. So, so essentially when we do numerics here, thing, so we use special coordinates that allow us to really, really define that particular region where we are near horizon. Mm -hmm. So we can absolutely do this without too much trouble. We can actually go to a lot higher spin as well, and you'll see some of that in a little bit later. But this is fairly well-resolved effects that we're seeing in there. Can this be computer analytically? Possibly. Yeah. We haven't tried to do that. So the only pa place I do know this has been done analytically is this work by, that I mentioned earlier uh, by Yan Bai Chen's group in which they basically do it for the scalar case, not for the gravitational case. So, uh, which of course gives you something that's suggestive. But I think they only did extreme low curve. They didn't quite do near extreme low curve. So this is still you know, different in that way. Okay, so, so one uh, neat outcome. Oh, yeah. The previous slide, so just because sure. I cannot really read the the log scale in your uh, vertical axis there, but it right. looks like it's very. If it's in the unit of strand, it looks very big, isn't it? Isn't it like yeah, so this is basically normalized. Essentially, we set, uh, you divide by mass ratio. So some of these numbers are normalized to a certain thing. So this would not be, this would be on the 10 to the negative 22 or 21 scale if you do it. In our paper, we did do that, actually. So if you, if you want to look in this paper, you can find the real numbers, strain numbers. But here, this is sort of a normalized amplitude, so I wouldn't worry too much about the scale. But for that to be detectable, we still need the mass ratio of 10 to minus 5. So, okay, so I'll backtrack a little bit. So yes, it is true that we did this calculation for an M rate, but in principle, you can imagine similar behavior that would happen even for a comparable mass uh, system, as long as one of them, or maybe both of them, or the end result you get is still a near extremal black hole. And then you would essentially see this behavior coming shortly after <coughs> the plunge happens. And so this particular behavior you should be able to see as long as the end final black hole you get is a very high spin black hole. It's also for mines. So yeah, so the idea would be that if somehow you end up with a spin of that type in the end, you know, for a merger of two no, black holes. No, what I is if the sign of the spin is minus. Oh. Retrograde uh, of orbit. Retrograde, this would not be the case. Yeah, no. you would not find this there, yeah. Okay, so a nice outcome of, of this particular uh, calculation is that there is this uh, mystery associated to these wiggles so that some of the literature had over the last year or two, so we were able to figure out why it's happening in a very clear kind of way. So about a year or so ago, Thornburg and his colleagues were looking at these highly elliptic orbits around near extreme uh, curved black holes. This is again all in theory. And what they found are these strange little wiggles in the waveform, this is the scalar and the gravitational waveform, uh, that appear soon after the smaller object passes through the periapsis. So the waveform they found looks something like this. This is a gravitational wave as a function of time. And this piece over here, this burst, is of course the gravitational wave coming from the whirl part of, the, of, the, of this in spiral, uh, of this orbit. 
And then the wiggles they're talking about are essentially, if you zoom into this phase <coughs> over here, you'll find little wiggles coming through, which is something that we're not seeing before. So they notice this the first time. The other peculiar thing about these wiggles is that if you look at a near extremal black hole, the central black hole is having very, very high spin, then these wiggles have a frequency that doesn't quite match quasi-normal ringing. It's actually lower than that, the most dominant quasi-normal mode. And also the frequency varies. So you have lower frequency here and basically and it, the frequency increases as you go down the length of the wiggle. So they were quite puzzled by what could be happening and they were wondering if it's the same, it's a different new phenomenon that one is observing. Yeah. What's happening all the way in the end? So this is kind of the other, the other world. So essentially when you zoom out and you come back to the next world, so you have basically this burst as the next, next pulse coming from the world part. Okay? And it's interesting to note that when you approach the peristron, you don't see this wiggle. It's really after you pass it. So they sort of saw a few couple things that were quite puzzling to them. So they presented this as an open question in the last year or so. And what we did is we decided to look at this more carefully. And we found that it's, again, the same ro role of overtones that appears here as well. So essentially what we thought was that when you have an object on an elliptic orbit, and it's basically approaching a near extreme of black hole, it's going to get, the object's going to get close to the light ring. And that's going to excite a lot of quasi normal ringing. In addition, it's going to slide lots of overtones. So when you stack up these overtones, when you sum them all up, there are weird behavior, which I already mentioned, this strange behavior that emerges. And we expect that perhaps what they were observing is a result of that same exact type of behavior. And notice they found it for the same 5-9 type of uh, uh, black hole. So, so you, you need to have very, very high spin to notice this. So we sort of thought that it had to be related to what we were seeing earlier with the, the, the study I showed you before. So what we did was quite a lot of analysis, and here's some plots from the paper. So once again, what we're looking at here is the log amplitude as a function of time, the same type of plot I showed you guys before. Uh, and this time, we're focused in only on the wiggles part of the waveform. So once again, for the highest spin case, which is the 5 nines case, you can basically see there's a curvature to that particular uh, uh, plot, which suggests that this is not a pure quasi-normal mode. This is probably a sum of quasi-normal modes, which is kind of uh, suggestive that overtones are playing a role over here. But then we also went ahead and analyzed the instantaneous frequency as a function of time across the wiggle. So that's the, that's the data which you're seeing over here. So the frequency is in blue. You can see that it varies in time. And uh, notice what the y-axis is. It's basically the log of the difference between the frequency that we measure to the most dominant quasi-normal mode. So this suggests that the frequency is approaching the right answer, which is the quasi-normal mode over here, and approaching it exponentially. So that's interesting. So what we found is that the frequency is varying, but asymptotically it's approaching the right answer, which is the most dominant quasi normal mode. Uh, turns out that this particular effect is something that has been calculated before, in fact, by Andy's group, which is this paper I was mentioning earlier, in which they find that the frequency varies in this particular form for a plunging uh, uh, type of a scenario, not a zoom world orbit like we're looking at. So we just went ahead and plotted this exactly, just as is, with no tuning, no, no fitting of any, any kind, just plotted this directly onto these plots over here, these graphs here. And you can see the red dotted lines, which is basically this, this formula here, agrees really, really well with what we found, especially at the late stages. So we didn't quite expect that at all, but it seems to agree. And this expression also comes from a sum of overtones. So this is very suggestive that indeed the overtones are playing a significant role in explaining this phenomenon, and they themselves could be very interesting from an observational perspective going forward. Yeah. So I'll pause for a moment, see if there's any questions. If not, then I'm going to move to a somewhat separate topic related, but somewhat different. So uh, uh, before I switch topics, I'll just see if any questions come up. Mm -hmm. What are these wiggles at very late times at the bottom two plots? Are these numerical? Yeah, numbers? those are just that sort of bad data coming from numerics, yeah. <coughs> okay. So switching topics a little bit. So now we're talking about the very, very late time stage. Uh, and this is the price tail stage uh, of this scalar or gravitational waveform. 
So uh, I know that Stephanus has talked about this before here, so I sort of I'll summarize quickly what he's presented in the past. So uh, many of you may, know, may be aware that when you talk about extremal rays and from black holes, uh, it's well known now that this particular integral uh, that Stephanus Artakis derived a few years ago is a conserved quantity, so this is conserved charge. Um, and what's very interesting about this is that just last year or so, he was able to come up with a way of calculating the same quantity, this Artakis charge, also at null infinity using an expression like this one. So the reason this becomes interesting is because this is a sort of an observable. This is scalar field, so it's not quite something that you know people can run with. But at least in a, in a concept, this is an observable. You can calculate this charge at null infinity. So it essentially is uh, an interesting thing to look at, especially one could come up with a gravitational wave analog of this quantity here. Um, so, and I believe that Stephanus has talked about this here relatively recently. So what we did is we first of all tested this uh, numerically. And in addition to that, not only at Iceland Nordstrom, we decided to just go ahead and try it out for Kerr as well, for extremal Kerr as well. We found the results work exactly the same, which was not known before, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Are you still using your compactified coordinates? Yes. How does how can you study late time things when you've dramatically changed the long distance geometry? So well, so the the calculation we're doing here is at null infinity, and that's part of our coordinate system. So we can propagate signals to null infinity and calculate these quantities without too much trouble. So uh, did that answer your question at all? I can come back to it if you want to. So, uh, so what we find basically, so I'm going to just go ahead and show you a few things, point out a few things over here. So S is this quantity at null infinity, uh, which is supposed to be able to give us the value of this charge. And in this little blue dotted line, you're seeing the value on the horizon of this Artakis charge. So as you, you can sort of see asymptotically, these approach each other, which is exactly what the effect is supposed to be, or the calculus is supposed to yield. You can also figure out what the difference between these two is and plot them as a function of time and see what rate do these approach each other. We found that they approach each other in inverse time, so which is kind of not something that's known, uh, but it would be kind of cool to see if analytically one can sort of see why that would be the case. But the fact is that Stefanos' results work not only for Reisner Nordstrom case, but also for the extremal Kerr case. And as I said, that was not known before. So we went ahead and decided to see what happens when you have near extremal Kerr and see if, uh, even in a near extremal context, is this true to some extent or not. So what you're looking at here are the near extremal cases, both for Reisner Nordstrom and also for Kerr. And it's the same type of plot. So this red flat line is meant to be the charge at the horizon for the extremal case. And these other curves are meant to be the S quantity, the quantity at null infinity, uh, for different spins. So the sub-extremal case is this one here. So the sub-extremal case is supposed to go to zero, which is kind of what you see. S is going to go asymptotically down to zero. So that's something that would happen to a slow rotating black hole. As you crank up the spin of the black hole, you're going to basically see these curves popping up as you go further down on this graph. So there's two interesting pieces here. So one piece that's interesting is that all of these are going to ultimately asymptotically go to zero, which is, of course, as expected. But the higher the spin, the longer these curves tend to hover around the right the extremal value, in a sense. And you can make this sort of uh, intermediate regime over which a near extremal black hole looks like an extremal black hole, arbitrary long uh, as you want. So again, if you want to see, if I want to have this regime last, let's say for a few thousand m or a few hundred m long, you note that you need five nines again. So you need five nines in the spin parameter, and essentially you would see that the non-extremal case would look just like the extremal case. Okay. So we did some more analysis, and we came up with sort of a formula which basically tells you how the extremal case differs from the non-extremal case. And it looks like the term looks like uh, uh, a very simple form of this type. So in other words, the difference between them uh, goes quadratically in time. And it's proportional to the first power of this uh, 1 minus A over M quantity. Why? No idea. It would be interesting to look at analytically and see why this would be happening. This is just a numerical result that we have. 
What's cool about this is you can use this quantity to come up with maybe different kinds of estimates, like how fast you have to be if you've got, let's say, if you can sort of resolve something for a certain amount of time. So you can kind of use this formula for some interesting estimates of anonymity. Good okay. question. Yeah. In what sense is it a conserved charge, and do you have intuition for what what the conversation, like what that, how that arises in the, the expression you showed before? So it's a conserved charge in the sense that it stays constant; it doesn't change in time. But uh, it's evaluated. Is, it's evaluated on the. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll go back. This one here. Yes. Right. It's evaluated. Does that EH mean event horizon? Event horizon. Right. So it's constant in V. In V. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And about intuitively what this is, don't ask me, you should ask Stefanos. Yeah, I have no idea what intuitively that means. And maybe somebody here can say more. Uh, analogous to electric charge? No, no, not really, yes, yeah. Because that in case, that would be a separate case, a separate uh, parameter here in the RN case. The same expression works for extreme low charge too, of course. So it's not much to do with it. In this case, it's only conserved in the extreme limit, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. And you can conserve it approximately for some time when you're extremely yeah. So to summarize, the bottom line is that uh, there are these potentially interesting signatures of the extremal occur and extremal occur. So as I said, there are aspects of poison normal ringing that are interesting, the one over T fall off that I talked about and the frequency varying. Those are definitely something that you know uh, people working on data analysis and LIGO can use today for those type of things. But the, the Aritaka's charge piece is a bit more speculative. We only have results for the scalar case, and uh, you know it's sort of unclear how some of that would translate to the gravitational case. Uh, but the only disappointing piece of this is that it seems like what you really need are these five nines in the spin parameter for these to really be distinctive. So currently, we're looking into um, the higher L modes uh, for, uh, for the Aritakis scalar study to see by chance if there's other charges that have better behavior, maybe aren't quite as sensitive to you know, needing that highest spin. And also looking for a, a gravitational wave quantity similar to this particular scalar quantity uh, that Aritakis derived. Um, and uh, if there's a way to talk about uh, observation with, with that. Psi4 appears to have a similar behavior, so it's possibly promising to look for a quantity that is purely gravitational in the nature um, that will have similar characteristics. Okay, so stop here. <laughs> Questions? Is there any hint of serious tension between no hair and this Aristarchus charge? There's some discussion on that. Difference though, and I'll show. I'll make a point on that quickly. Oops, I didn't do that. So here, so the issue is that this field itself, the scalar field itself, goes to zero or decays down. So what you're doing here for the for the calculation of infinity, you're scaling it up. So it's not the case that there's the field itself that survives, and you're able to observe the field itself outside the black hole. It is decaying. You're just being able to do sort of a rescaling of it to be able to extract the value, which is this chart. So in that sense, there is no tension. Although I have seen in literature people refer to it as horizon hair or, you know, sort of Aritaka's hair or something. So it has been called hair, but my understanding is that that's sort of a loose reference to, to hair. It's not quite what we normally mean by hair. Yeah. So when two black holes collide, each of them has this one. If they merge, is it conserved? So that I don't know. Um, that's a very good question. So this is a conserved quantity only for the extreme black right. hole. So, so if you so imagine you have two, two extreme two black extreme. holes and they form yeah. an extreme yeah. black hole, yes. um, it's a very good question. I don't know. Yeah, we'll but but is, that, is that something, that a scenario that general relativity would even support, though? Probably not, yeah. yeah that's Why? Because it's you know, thermodynamics, right? So you have two two objects. They undergo some non-equilibrium process. You're going to end up with something which has finite uh, um, uh, it's, uh, m over. A. Sorry, you're not going to end up with an extreme black hole at the end, just in the same sense that you wouldn't end up with a, with a with a zero temperature uh, state when you had two systems interact. Yeah. Well, but if they are closer to the limit than necessary, then maybe even after the merger, there are. I mean, it depends on the masses and it depends on. The, Anyway, it might be interesting to examine. Yeah, that is an interesting question. Yeah. So, one of the reasons that you need so many lines 
one of the reasons is that typically this, this quantities depend on the square root of one minus a over n. It's true, yeah. But we showed the formula there which was linear at one minus a over n. Right. Uh, and yet it had a very small coefficient. What is this coefficient you have in front? So this is a numerically determined coefficient. It's just basically telling you that if you're looking at the difference between these charge values, uh, the non-affinity calculation, what coefficient has to go up front, purely numerically derived. Um, over, over, over a range of A over M, which is? So over, is yes, over a vast range of A over M. So basically, you can see the data that we have over here. So essentially, from a one, so this value here, 1 minus A over M, varies from 10 to the negative 1 to 10 to the negative 9. Nice. So it's a huge range of A over M, yes. And, and this constant came out to be small for unknown reason. So as I said, even the dependence of T squared here or U squared here and this linear factor is completely unknown, at least to my knowledge, uh, mathematically. It's only purely numerical. Usually if something is so incredibly small, there's some conceptual way of understanding. I would hope so too, yeah. So well, actually sorry, we is, is S of psi normalized to one? Otherwise this isn't very meaningful. Right. So that's true. So these uh, values, um, the S quantity that we're talking I about. I mean if S of psi is also 0 0.06 yeah. then. So that is actually an important thing to point out. Oops. Um, that when we did these calculations, so everywhere when you see the scalar field over here, so it's, it's typically taken to be a Gaussian and has an amplitude which goes up to a 1 in essence. So you do have that factor in there. Of course, it's a scalar field, so we don't really know what scale to set anyway. If we were doing gravitational waves, that would be different. But it's true that this is set to order 1 quantity. So, uh, so in that sense, you know, you can imagine essentially if you change that, you would scale everything by whatever factor you're multiplying with. So if you're multiplying by some scaling, then you would do that throughout consistently. Okay. Do have one more question? Yeah. So we're lucky to have Chris Meek from the University of Western Ontario who will be talking about uh, strong censorship of size and movement. Oh, uh, we'll be talking to us about <laughs> <laughs> letting me know censorship <laughs> and the limits of GR. Okay, so um, now for something entirely different. So I'm a philosopher, and I'll be approaching these questions from a different perspective than uh, 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 a lot of the mathematical physics work that uh, has been going on recently on censorship. But I thought it'd be interesting for you to hear about how philosophers have approached these questions of determinism and censorship. I think we have a lot to learn because there's been enormous progress recently in discussions of strong cosmic censorship in particular. So these questions are old. They go back to the very early days in the study of general relativity. Um, so this is a diagram from Hawking and Ellis's a wonderful book in 1973 illustrating the problem of uh, possibly naked singularities. This is uh, Reisner Nordstrom, um, uh, the maximal extension. You can see that there would be regions of space from which uh, a singularity, which is a time-like singularity, would be visible. And so uh, censorship, as you all know, was motivated by the idea that if you want to enforce determinism in some sense, you have to do something about these naked singularities. And uh, there's two different formulations. I'll be focusing on the strong version. But the first is that can we f uh, formulate some restriction on what a physically reasonable space time is, such that we can say naked singularities don't uh, arise in those sorts of, sorts of solutions? Or alternatively, and I won't be talking about this proposal in detail, perhaps you can say that there are safe regions of space time in some sense, exterior of black hole solutions, 
in which you uh, are not able to see naked singularities. I'll be talking mainly about the strong version of censorship. And I want to emphasize that there's a few questions that have motivated the way philosophers have thought about these issues, and I want to focus on these. Um, so the first is just what conditions need to be imposed for determinism to hold in general relativity, and how should we go about trying to justify these conditions? What's the status of them? So there's kind of the mathematics question, which is what's the actual formulation of the content of these requirements? What do we actually have to impose? And then there's the more physical or epistemic question, what's the status of those? Is that something we should just assume? Is it something that we uh, will hope to be able to derive from other plausible assumptions? Yeah. Um, we know that GR is not a complete theory. It doesn't have quantum mechanics. So yes. Why should we forbid uh, so, you know, naked singularities? If, if we had the complete theory, we would ask uh, determinism to apply. But the incomplete, obviously, might not be. Right, so I think there's a lot of work that's been done trying to look at the quantum effects in space-time to see also if it will uh, enforce censorship or lead to uh, uh, censorship results. So I think that's a, a very interesting line of work. I think we can also ask, though, at least, what does classical general relativity have to say? Does it, I mean, it might have resources on its own to resolve these questions. That would be interesting. It might turn out that we need to see it as part of a further theory. And actually, that's my next question. Um, if we have failures of determinism, does that reveal something about the limits of general relativity? Does it reveal that we have to take, I mean, we already know that we need to quantize gravity for other reasons, but would we need to take those uh, quantum gravity effects into account just to resolve these issues of determinism? Yeah. Yeah. I don't I usually say this in mathematical physics um, mm -hmm. talks on cosmic censorship, but since you're a philosopher, there, right. there is a philosophical point about cosmic censorship very close to what Mm -hmm. Abby just said that really bothers me. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, I'm going to say it a little stronger than Avi did, I think mm -hmm. we know that in the real world, cosmic censorship is not valid because black holes evaporate and they reach a, su uh. they reach a small size where the laws of physics as we know them no longer hold. Mm -hmm. So we know it's not true in the exact world. It would be a good thing not a bad thing if cosmic censorship were violated because then we could just look up at the sky and we wouldn't need to build Planck scale accelerators and mm -hmm. we'd see regions of high curvature. So it's very hard to understand, for me to understand why, you know, Wheeler, Pedros, and all those people mm -hmm. thought it should be valid, valid. And I would turn the whole thing around on its ear, which is why is it? so close or maybe even actually being true for classical general relativity. Mm. I don't know any reason why it should be close to being true. It seems like there's some statement of it that is true, probably. It, mm. You know, the mathematicians are still struggling with it, but and so I think we're it's a signal that we're missing something about about the about the real world. Why yeah, it should be true. You could have had a world in which we would see naked singularities all the time popping up. Mm -hmm. And that would be explained in terms of quantum mechanics and gravity. And Einstein would simply not be able to explain it, but he doesn't have the full theory. You know? No, I, so I, I'm not going to be talking about the specific issue about black hole evaporation. That's a, obviously, that's a very interesting question. The kinds of contexts that I'm looking at are going to be slightly different, as you'll see. I don't think, I think the, the question you ended up with is really interesting, which is even if you don't think the cosmic censorship holds in general, there's a lot of results supporting the claim in the specific context I'll be talking about, and you could still be puzzled about why those hold. So yeah. I, think, I, I think, you know. So before general relativity, we had mm -hmm. Maxwell theory, which you can solve it, and surprisingly, Yang-Mills theory also doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't produce singularities. And so our previous examples of theories didn't drive themselves into regimes where they needed to be improved. General relativity does, but that's not, that's good. Mm. Not bad, and it bothered people when they first saw it, but it shouldn't, I think. Well, I think the, the, the nature of the bother is actually, uh, so I don't think it's, um, there's a worry about general relativity just leading to singularities that Einstein and others had, which I think is maybe more like the, the worry that you were phrasing, which is just, uh, does general relativity lead to singularities? Does that indicate that there's a fundamental problem with the theory full stop? I think the worry about cosmic censorship as Penrose and others had it was a, a bit different. Namely, there's a very specific feature 
Uh, you might think yeah. that time-like singularities, naked singularities, would be wonderful. But he was asking, does dynamics of general relativity itself enforce some kind of structure associated with time-like singularities, either event horizons, or is it that you always get the first kind of problem, the curvature singularity, before you get to a time-like singularity? That's the strong version of cosmic censorship. And so that's the, the latter question is the one I want to focus on. And so I, I realize that from a quantum gravity point of view, there'll be very different uh, uh, orientations of this. I think one question, though, and I think this is philosophers have looked at other cases like this, that perhaps looking at the sort of pathological behavior of one theory can help us see what the successor theory might look like. And so I think of this in those sorts of terms. So um, now obviously this is uh, uh, a bit of background. The, uh, in, in mathematical physics, typically we just think about what is a deterministic theory. We equate that with the ex existence of an initial value formulation or a well-posed initial value formulation. Um, and that's just the requirement that if you have uh, the laws expressed in the form of some set of differential equations, that for appropriate initial data in specified on some region, you have existence, uniqueness, and a sort of continuous dependence on that set of initial data. Now, I've highlighted the last because this is something that um, philosophers have by and large set aside. So in a lot of the philosophical discussions of determinism, the focus is just on whether you have unique solutions for some <coughs> set of dynamical equations. And so I think this is actually going to be the crucial uh, property of a well posed initial value formulation that's important in these discussions of uh, stability. And so obviously you can think of all kinds of different cases in physics, but uh, uh, we employ uh, a lot of hyperbolic partial differential equations which have some of the same very pleasant features of the wave equation. There's a causal structure that arises due to the maximum signal speed of the, of the waves and that gives you a sense of domains of dependence. And so in that setting for a wave equation, you can specify initial data on a space like hypersurface. And then you have a domain of dependence, which are the regions that are connected to initial data at propagation speeds below the wave propagation speed. So there's been a lot of discussions in philosophy, which you might not have come across before, of these questions of determinism in a more uh, uh, humdrum kind of easy setting. Let me just mention these briefly. Uh, this is a case of uh, a constraint surface that has a kind of odd equation governing the constraint surface. And if you imagine a ball sliding on this constraint surface, you get a failure of uniqueness. You can show that the equations of motion is sort of not determined when the ball slides down. Those instead be a class of solutions which have different departure times. So is this a failure of determinism in any interesting kind of sense? I think the question that this raises is just, what do we count as a Newtonian system? And in this case, the constraint surface that John Norton has specified is one that fails to be C2 at the apex. So that's just a kind of standard continuity condition that we require in order for all the quantities that appear in our equations to be well defined. So it seems pretty natural in this case to say, you've just sort of violated the, the rules of having a mathematically well defined system, right? So in this case, I think it's pretty natural to just say, when we introduce a Newtonian system, we implicitly have to make assumptions about constraint surfaces and other things so that the quantities our dynamics requires are well defined. There's a more interesting case that you might have heard of this before. It's called the Space Invaders case in the philosophy literature. But there's uh, this is a proof due to Zia in 1992 where you imagine five interacting point particles. They have to be truly point particles for reasons that you'll see. They're just there about interacting gravitationally. And you imagine. The two pairs are uh, binary systems, and then there's a kind of uh, particle shuttling between them. And if you could set up initial conditions with exquisite precision, you could set it up such that the shuttling particle goes back and forth between these pairs, such that their in spiral tightens, and it accelerates with each, with each shot back and forth, such that all five particles accelerate off to infinity within some finite time. Now, they have to be point particles, obviously, because otherwise, at some point, they would collide. But this is uh, a non-collision singularity in the sense that these never collide. And you're actually able to, um, in some sense, 
violate what seemed like a natural condition. You had a system of five particles, and then later on, they've all disappeared. Now, the, I think this raises a more interesting question, because it's not just obviously violating the rules of the game in terms of what you've defined mathematically, but I think what we can say about this case is that we often, in applying Newtonian particle physics, just make an assumption. We have a fixed number of particles. What we don't recognize is that, that assumption actually makes, uh, implies something about boundary conditions of time-like infinity, or ba boundary conditions at uh, time-like surface at infinity, namely that rule out all of these particles disappearing. If I assume that I have a fixed number of particles, I'm making a quite strong assumption. Now this is obviously because the system is not governed by hyperbolic PDEs. So in terms of what do these failures of determinism reveal, well in this case, in the Space Invaders case, I don't think we need to be too troubled about that in the sense that we know that the causal structure of uh, relativity is going to enforce causal restrictions that were not present in Newtonian physics. So that kind of uh, worry doesn't seem to arise. What kind of conditions need to be imposed? Well, again, I think here we see that we have continuity conditions that we've recognized as we formulated Newtonian physics. We recognize that these had to be imposed. And secondly, that we saw that there's a different form of boundary conditions that we needed than perhaps we might have realized at the outset. So in reflecting on this warm-up case, I think we can see the kinds of things that arise in uh, looking at these cases of failures of determinism. Can you have uh, uh, waves with phase velocities that are uh, arbitrarily large, but that travel on a finite group velocity? Um, as a fit, like a, as an example of a sort of space invaders case? I mean, so... so uh, no, just if you have a wave equation and... Yeah, it, it can, you just have a... Uh, um, uh, so I'm trying to think of what type of objects are, are constrained that uh, they can't develop these infinite discontinuities or... or um, a, would, would waves be some type of object that you would want to... Uh, forbid from having some sort of, uh, uh, not just faster light, but, but in infinite uh, speed. Right, I haven't thought as much about the, the fluid mechanics case. So in fluid mechanics, you get other kinds of things. You get shocks and things forming that lead to, to questions. So you're concerned, though, about whether you have fluid flows that would lead to sort of propagation at higher than the uh, uh, speed of propagation of the waves, that's the... Well, I'm tr trying to get a handle of what type of objects uh, would violate this determinism, would, would uh, even disturbances in a medium, if mm. they have some sort of uh, uh, unbounded group velocity, but they can't transmit information uh, faster than that, which would be that the group team would be to transfer information, would those types of objects be, be forbidden, uh, forbidden if you want a deterministic uh, theory? Um, no, I don't think I need to rule that out. Uh, ab, you know, so the, the point is the earlier cases are just cases where I say in a very, very simplified setting, I'm just talking about particles. If we wanted to talk about fluids and waves, then I think within that context you could ask what, does, uh, what kind of conditions do you need to impose on the waves in order for the uh, set of hyperbolic PDEs or whatever it is that you've written out governing the system, what do you have to impose in order for those to be well defined? So I think. This was just meant to illustrate that in some even very simple cases, you have to make stronger assumptions than maybe you realize, and the character of, the, of those assumptions might not be something you And you're just talking about the dynamics of particles. And you, okay. Yeah, no, this is a, in a simple case, in, in fluid mechanics, you might have different sorts of constraints that you'd have to have for deterministic evolution. But again, the wave equation is very nice because it's a hyperbolic PDE. So in that setting, the questions of determinism are usually more straightforward. Um, in any case, let's shift to looking at the initial value formulation for general relativity. Um, again, this is something I'm sure um, everyone here knows better than I do, but the, there's a proof um, initially due to Choquet, Bruja, and Garoche um, establishing that for appropriate initial data on a global time slice, there is a unique up to isometry maximal solution to the vacuum field equation. So this can be extended for some results for matter fields as well. So if you have appropriate initial data, I'm not specifying exactly what that is, but you can fill, fill this in in more detail. You then have a unique maximal solution up to isometry. But in proving this, they had to make uh, an important assumption about the nature of the space-time 
uh, that they were considering, they had to uh, assume what's called global hyperbolicity. And this is, there are various conditions, various equivalent ways of stating what global hyperbolicity involves. But one way is that there are surfaces, so-called Cauchy surfaces, such that the domain of dependence of that surface is the entire space-time. Um, and if the space-time is globally hyperbolic, then it's topologically sigma cross r, where sigma is the topology of this uh, global time slice, or Cauchy surface. But, and this is where the specific kind of failure of determinism that I'm interested in comes in, um, it's important to note that in the proof that uh, Garrosh and Choquet Bruhat gave, maximal does not imply an extendable. So it's possible to have uh, a maximal part of the space time that is the domain of dependence of the initial slice, which is still embedded in a larger space time. So it can be extended through, uh, through what's uh, now called, this is Hawking's formulation, the Cauchy horizon. Um, and so here's a very simple space time called Misner space time where what's uh, uh, illustrated here is that the light cones are tipping over as you go up the vertical axis. And so um, just if you think about the, what the curves will be in this region here, there will be curves that never intersect this slice. And so those will obviously not be part of the domain of dependence because the domain of dependence, all the curves, the time light curves have to intersect the slice in order to be within the domain of dependence. Um, so the lower part of this will be the, it, within the domain of dependence of the slice, but the solution can be extended through this Cauchy horizon. So the data fail to fix a unique solution past this Cauchy horizon, past the boundary of the domain of dependence. And it turned out this is a very simple example, but this is something that arises in various other exact solutions where you have extensions of an initial uh, maximal globally hyperbolic development of some set of data that you specified, you can then extend past that in different ways. Um, and so, uh, more strongly then, for several exact solutions, there are inequivalent non-isometric extensions. So there are extensions that are actually different in terms of their metric of the initial domain of dependence. Um, and just to note, there's, there's something odd about these though. They're kind of weird global extension. So the way that you get the failure of isometry, in one case that's an analog of this, you have to consider extensions both to the top and the bottom, in effect, of the initial domain of dependence. And I'd be curious if th this is a result from 1993. There might be more recent results, but the crucial and Eisenberg paper shows that you can have these non-isometric extensions in cases where you have disconnected components of the Cauchy horizon. So what you have where you have non-isometric extensions, you have extensions that are different for these different disconnected pieces of the Cauchy horizon. So they show that this is possible in a few cases, Taubna uh, and a few other space times. I don't know of any cases where it's a local extension through a single connected piece of a Cauchy horizon that leads to non-isometric extensions. Is Van Rats has some paper to that effect. Ah, okay. From a few years ago. Okay, great. So, so then there is a result that you can have yes. local good. Yes. Good, that strengthens the, the case then. So um, <coughs> now there's a set, several responses to this kind of case. Um, one is just, well, let's just say we assume that all the space times we're working with are globally hyperbolic. Right? So if I assume the space time is globally hyperbolic, I've in effect ruled out by fiat cases like the previous one. Because in the case where you have an extension, then the initial globally hyper hyperbolic piece failed, that is now a non-globally hyperbolic space-time. Why don't we just say all the physically reasonable space-times we're interested in have this property of global hyperbol hyperbolicity? And uh, John Manchak has done some work on this. The problem is this seems like a pretty substantial assumption to be making without further argument. It isn't, um, I've always used the example of assuming your manif manifold is house door, it actually <coughs> seems like a kind of mathematical condition that's fairly natural to assume. Why would you think of a non-Hausdorff manifold? It turns out now there are philosophers who are thinking about non-Hausdorff manifolds, but leave that to one, one side. It just seems like a mathematical property that it's safe to assume, sort of like assuming that your constraint surface is sufficiently uh, continuous. So it's easy to disprove this if you find an example that evolves from this initial condition to something that is non 
<laughs> well, this would, I mean, that's what we have. We have vacuum solutions that do that. So there are vacuum solutions that are non-globally hyperbolic. So this would be adding something extra. You'd have to be saying, we're not just talking about general relativity. We're talking about general relativity plus this further restriction. I know, but if you start from something like this, and mm -hmm. you end up in something that is not like this, then right. you know that it's not a good assumption. Right, no, you want something that's dynamically closed or something right. that once you've restricted, that you stay within that restricted class. So that's, um, but I think the, the more general uh, uh, sort of consensus among relativists who've worked on this is just that it seems like it's too substantive an assumption to impose by fiat. It seems like something that should be in here, Hawking is saying, maybe gravity is, some, is telling us something Rather, we should try to deduce that certain re regions of space time are globally hyperbolic from other physically reasonable assumptions. So he doesn't feel comfortable just asserting global hyperbolicity um, by fiat. And this then is where strong cosmic censorship comes in. It's in effect a claim that generically, the domain of dependence <coughs> for suitable initial data is inextendable. Now obviously I have to fill this in quite a bit to specify what I mean by suitable initial data. I'm going to comment more on the two words that I've emphasized here, generically and extendable. And there's the motivation from Penrose that we should expect the existence of a Cauchy horizon to be associated with a curvature singularity. So you, you should expect, actually, a singularity to form before the Cauchy horizon because of instabilities as you approach this surface. Now let me comment, this is more um, a kind of comment directed at philosophers, uh, of which I might, well, there's at least one other in the room. So, <laughs> um, so one thing that's important that I think I mentioned earlier, the philosophers tend to neglect the third aspect of a well-posed initial value formulation, a requirement of uh, continuity uh, or stability. And this is really essential in this formulation of the strong cosmic censorship hypothesis as well. So what, what do we mean by generic initial data? Well, we mean that it should be an open set of initial data in some topology. Um, and we want to make sure that the results are stable under perturbations. I think I've formulated this in a, in a funny way. But in any case, um, the examples that I've mentioned earlier of spaces where you have multiple non-isometric extensions, all are quite symmetric. They're very simple. And we could ask, are those really things that would arise from an open set of initial data? Or are they things that are very special? Special just like the space invaders case um, that I mentioned in Newtonian particle physics. But philosophers have been quite skeptical of whether we can actually even make this stability argument precise. So Ehrman, 1995, says, to make this argument precise, one would need to define a topology on the set of solutions. Um, and he thinks it seems rather grandiose to think that we can do so. I think Fletcher's response to this is good, that you could actually, you don't need to imagine that you've defined a topology over the whole space of solutions of Einstein's field equations. What we really want to ask are for specific situations, can we introduce a notion of stability um, associated with parameter variations or variations away from some solution that we're looking at to start? Uh, sorry, that's what I've just said here. I think. What we should do, and this is, I think, a problem in foundations of physics that philosophers should be looking at, is what we should do is try to assess the stability of specific solutions. And then we can assess whether the examples that we've had are ones that um, we should worry about. So for example, um, if we have, and we have some results from Moncrieff and Eisenberg showing that Cauchy horizons are associated with the existence of killing fields in the neighborhood of the Cauchy horizons. That indicates that these are very highly symmetric situations. And that seems to indicate also that they would be of measure zero in any reasonable topology on the space of solutions. So I think filling in that argument could help to. Um, Just a little comment on these. Yeah. Um, so in the earlier case, they were analytic, and they had some very strong assumptions on the generators of the Cauchy horizon. Right. They that weakened that in the. No, it's still analytic. Ah, so okay. they have in the in the second paper in 2018. What they show is that the generators need to be almost closed in the sense right. of spanning a torus uh, topologically, mm -hmm. um, so that they they're, they're not quite closed, but they kind of sweep out a torus as they go right. around. So, uh, but they're still analytic. So, so that's a very so it's still a very strong that's a very strong thing. Right. Right. Um, okay. So, and you know. This might be the case where 
the existing results don't fully support the kind of claim, but I think the interesting question is, can you make uh, oh, a version sure, yeah. of the stability argument precise? And I think, I think that we can in the kind of uh, way that Fletcher suggests. Um, and the second comment is just about an extendable, and this has come up in discussions recently of uh, uh, proofs. Uh, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, there's been a lot of work recently on the strong cosmic censorship hypothesis. We were discussing some of this over lunch. Um, and one question is, what level of continuity should we require of extensions through um, extensions of this domain of dependence, extensions through the uh, Cauchy horizon, in order for them to be interesting as counterexamples or in support of the strong cosmic censorship hypothesis. So there's a recent counterexample to strong cosmic censorship where they require only the, the solution is uh, inextendable as a C0 metric. But obviously, and they recognize this, there's a further thing that we might require, which is that we might be interested instead is defining the full field equations, not just the metric. And for that, we'd need something stronger to be able to continue the solution through the Cauchy horizons. We'd want to have the curvature, or we could put a constraint on uh, uh, the solution so that we could define the Christoffel symbols. And so Christodoulou, for example, has a formulation of strong cosmic censorship where it puts a specific constraint on here. So I, I realize this is a bit hand wavy, but let me come back then to my motivating questions just to see how these general, the sort of general philosophical approach here relates to what I've been saying about cosmic censorship. So what conditions need to be imposed for determinism to hold in general relativity and how should they be justified? Well, here we have a clear mathematical condition that's been formulated, global hyperbolicity. But this is a really strong constraint on causal structure, and as I said, people have been unsatisfying just imposing it by fiat. The dynamical justification for this is still an open issue, um, and it depends on the status of the strong cosmic censorship hypothesis. And so the questions that strike me as most interesting from a more philosophical or foundational point of view is, how do, what do we require and why do we make certain requirements about the inextendability uh, through the horizon, and how do we define stability um, uh, in these cases? And secondly, what do such cases reveal about the limits of general relativity? So now I'm finally circling back to the kind of question that was raised right at the outset. So this is a, a nice quote from Steven Weinberg back in 98. He was writing about Kuhn, and then this is an exchange of letters that uh, followed his initial piece. And here he says something that I think a lot of physicists would agree with about what we'd like to say about our uh, theories of meriti, right? The theories that we no longer regard as correct fundamental theories, but they still have some status. And he says, but approximate theories are not merely approximately true. They can make a statement that, though it refers to an approximation, it is nevertheless precisely true. For instance, although Maxwell's equations give only an approximate account of electric and magnetic fields, it's precisely true that the error introduced by using Maxwell's equations to calculate these fields can be made as small as one likes by considering fields that are sufficiently weak and slowly varying. And that's why they're a permanent part of physical science. So the question I'm interested in then is, do the pathologies, the sort of odd behavior of general relativity related to cosmic censorship, challenge attributing general relativity the approximate theory status that Weinberg here attributes to Maxwell's equations. And uh, one response is to say, well, no. Um, we can sort of divide and conquer. There are specific solutions of general relativity where maybe we have stability results for physically relevant sectors. All the context in which you're using general relativity to model systems, we might have a good understanding of the dynamical properties of those solutions so that when we're applying general relativity in astrophysics, we have a good sense of um, whether this kind of failure of determinism um, arises. Yes? Well, you would say the same thing about Maxwell field, right? If the fields are too strong, it's only in part of solution space. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think, and this is, uh, and why object to a theory with extra models is just to say, sure, there might be some models that you don't think represent uh, phenomena, and those might have bad behavior. And the same, I would say the same with Maxwell theory. So this would be uh, one kind of response. Um, I think there's a question, though, that, um, so again, does this kind of bad behavior challenge the status of GR's approximative, approximative theory? And this is partly just uh, to raise the question of, 
um, how clearly can we confine the pathologies that general relativity exhibits to something like the UV regime? So can we actually say with confidence that we know that these pathologies are associated with sort of a high energy or high curvature regime? If the cosmic censorship hypothesis holds, then those would be related, right? And we could say general relativity fails in a particular kind of regime. I think there's a, I say possibly, because it's not actually clear that we understand exactly where general relativity breaks down such that we can make this claim. So I think this is an interesting open question. And with that, I'll wrap up. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I, I just don't see the difference between general relativity and the Maxwell theory. In the Maxwell theory, if you focus a bunch of electromagnetic waves in a region, the solution will be okay for some time, but once the fields get too strong, it will break down. I don't see any difference. In what, I mean, I think the, the nature of singularities in general relativity is quite different than the kinds of singularities. Maxwell theory will fail to correspond to reality. Right. No, that's true, and that's what I think we would like to say about general relativity, that there are some regimes where... I think that's it, what Weinberg was that's saying. That's what Weinberg was saying, yeah. So, I don't understand why we couldn't replace well, general so, relativity, so, Maxwell right, with general right, right, relativity okay. in every, everywhere it occurs. Right, now, now I see the question. So I think it's a question of whether, from the point of view of QED, we can say precisely in what regime is Maxwell's theory an approximative theory in that sense. And the question I'm raising here is, do we understand, I mean, we don't have a final theory of quantum gravity, but from what we do know of quantum gravity, can we make the same case about general relativity? Here's exactly the regimes in which it says something that is an approximation in the sense of Weinberg is saying. And I'm just raising the question that perhaps we don't have that full story. Again, not surprising because we don't have the th theory of quantum gravity. But for the case of Maxwell, I would say that we don't the have a theory of quantum gravity. We also don't. QED also doesn't exist. We also don't have a theory of QED. QED right, is not Right, and it's part of the standard model because of the Landau pole. So, right. So, it's I going don't see the. I don't see any difference. We don't well, have an ultraviolet com completion either of QED. That's true. Or of or of quantum gravity. That's true. We have the successor, the immediate successor, which is also now a theory that is part of the ongoing process of theory development. The immediate successor, QED, gives us some insight into where Maxwell theory breaks down. We then ask the standard model, where does QED break down? We don't have a UV complete theory yet to tell us exactly how to think about the standard model. So you're right, we could be wrong in all of those claims we're making about what the limits of, or the regimes of applicability of the previous theories are. I'm saying in the case of general relativity, we don't even have the first step to the successor theory. Um, and so we know the quantum effects have to be important. Um, and we know that general relativity has various sorts of pathologies. How can we say that general relativity is exactly an approximate theory in Wein Weinberg sense in these sort of regimes? I certainly think that's a plausible position. I think that's the, you know, I'm certainly more in favor of this than in the cases where we have applied general relativity works wonderfully. Um, so in that context, I'm happy to say we should assume that that's true, but I don't think we have the same kind of argument that we can give for Maxwell. Yes? But Let's be practical. Uh, so, I mean, it's not a philosophical question because suppose we are observers, we look at the universe, mm -hmm. and we see naked singularities. Who cares what Einstein said? They exist. If we saw that, that would give us... You would call that. Now, the question is how would they look like, right? Mm -hmm. They might reveal something about quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. So it's in the same spirit as when using, you know, Maxwell's equations, suddenly you see that they break down, you see pair production in a very strong electric field, even mm -hmm. before it was calculated. We know that the theory is not describing it. Right. So my point is, this is not a matter of writing papers and theorizing about it, but in principle, we could search for it. Right. No, I think I, I think that's an interesting possibility, and I think the uh, yeah, if we observed, a, if we first of all knew enough about what a naked singularity should look like, and then we observed one, then yes, this would certainly change the status of the debate. I, I just had a, a point which is kind of uh, connected to some of the questions you raised, Andy, and and, and others, but. Just, just you know, um, from the mathematical community, from the mathematical perspective, the situation at present is really that of a wild jungle, in the sense that uh, for every case uh, considered, there will be different topologies on the space of initial data, 
And the only results we have in the direction of strong cosmic censorship by Christodoulou in the case of spherically symmetric uh, scatter field, that uh, n notion of genericity for which the conjecture was proven was, was highly tuned and specific to the problem at hand. So the point is uh, some general notion like Penrose's idea that, that this is a, a, a tangible um, thing to to seek at and to and to obtain. That's no one really believes that. It's it's a case by case, very nitty gritty, dirty uh, thing you have to study for all types of different matter models, all types of different initial data, all types of notion of genericity, all types of notion of regularity. It's more of a, an invitation for the mathematicians, the hyperbolic PDE people, to flex their muscles rather than you know some something like in the spirit of Penrose. At least that's what it's like in the mathematical community these days. You know? Okay, so I mean, I think that might also just reflect that in dealing with general relativity to define something like a topology on the space of solutions, you're often using structures that are very specific to the case sure. that you're introducing. So uh, I, I would expect that kind of that kind of proliferation of different notions of stability. There's no one unique thing. There's no there's no one big conjecture. So that's so. Yeah. So the question is partly. Uh, do you think that there's no conjecture at all, or is it just that the only context in which you're actually going to be able to pr prove precise results are going to be these very specific contexts? And then, I mean, I think the physicists would be tempted to say those give support to a broader conjecture that as you sort of show one by one that I'm saying all of these cases involve, yeah. you know, symmetries or non generic right, right. initial conditions. I'm, then saying, I'm saying that, like, for different setups of uh, the types of matter models or asymptotics or mm -hmm. some details of field equation whether you involve a lambda or not a lambda, right? There will be different formulations of what the right conjecture should be. Mm. That's the point. There's no one unique conjecture. There's, there will be some good conjectures for every, for every case scenario. So it's really so diverse that there's no sense that there's a common element running through that. Well, the common element is the one you outlined, namely yeah. initial data is it extended. Right, right. That's the common outline. But the details of that are so piecemeal mm. that it's very hard to come up with, you know, a, a, a the space of conjectures is at least C1, I think. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, I, I'm happy to take further questions, but I'm worried, I don't know if I'm cutting into the third speaker's time. Yeah. I keep it short. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>
because the, your, your Hubble radius shrinks in on them. So slow contraction means your Hubble radius is actually shrinking very, very rapidly and uh, the scale factor or any quantum induced mode is shrinking uh, very slowly. So starting with a, with a, a sub-horizon mode again uh, is becoming due to this different behavior of the different scales um, uh, super Hubble. And that's good because they have super Hubble wavelength, that's what we need in microwave background. So that's one of the puzzles, that's what you get also from inflation. How do you get super Hubble wavelength? But that's not enough. And we know that unlike an in inflation where the amplitude of the mode also gets uh, um, amplified and directly induces uh, um, the growth of adiabatic curvature was that then transfer into uh, temperature and isotropies of the microwave background. That's not the case in a slowly contracting phase which being a super smoother is interesting by its own, so what you need is, and this is the trick, so I just quickly summarize it because that will be the model that we study then non-perturbatively. The trick is to smooth the universe in terms of the scalar field that has a negative exponential potential, let's say any type of exponential potential that induces this phase of a scale factor shrinking much slower than the whole parameter. And uh, you don't get measurable gravitational waves, so no primordial beam modes. So this scenario is falsifiable in that sense. And you don't get uh, direct uh, the amplification of the amplitude of, of curvature fluctuations. Therefore, what you introduced is what you know you need in some sense from inflation. What, what does an inflation do the trick for you? Well, somehow the modes have to see a visitor background. So if they don't see, and, and how do they see it? Well, in the Klein Gordon equation, they see it through the damping fact that parameter, right? So if you look at here, this is actually from a talk I gave yesterday, Klein Gordon equation for a simple scalar field evaluated to the Friedman Robinson Walker background, that dot is just a time derivative and h is the Hubble parameter. The in addition to the potential, what uh, determines the evolution of the scalar is encoded into the damping factor. And we know that we need something, a very slowly varying and positive damping factor in order to imitate the sitter space or be actual in the sitter space and produce the type of mode that, that are good for us to expand the cosmic microwave background. Now, since in a slowly contracting phase, you would add the very quickly shrinking negative Hubble parameter, you are ending up in an anti-damping phase. That's good for your background, but not good for the field that should generate your fluctuations. And just so to wrap up, how do we cheat? Well, the very well known from particle physics nonlinear sigma type models give us, uh, introduce a second field that would see a dissertive background. So one field, it is so to speak a speci specialization of the fields to do the cosmology. You have a background field that smooths the background. It has a negative exponential potential. It does everything for you what you need, drives you from, we know it from arbitrary initial data towards an FRW universe. And at the same time, you want to find a second field that is frozen out where the solution is, the attractor solution is at least perturbative on an FRW background uh, frozen out field that only enters the dynamics to its quantum fluctuations. And unlike the first field that sees the Hubble anti-damping, the contracting background, you see here due to the nonlinear sigma type interaction coupled to the second field that is massless or nearly massless, um, you see here uh, this field, this high field, sees um, the sitter-like phase, just like so it, it, the field thinks that the background inflates even though it doesn't do that. And uh, accordingly, it produces the spectrum that you would also expect if you're familiar with inflation. The high field will produce you uh, starting, you can really imagine that the initial data for the high field are bunched there with quantum fluctuations. They become, the wavelengths become super Hubble due to the fact that I have shown you and they um, produce a nearly scale invariant and non-Gaussian spectrum of fluctuations, and I said, no tensor mode. So this is the model, this is just a summary. And this is the leading model in the context of contracting models to produce the observable, or the observed uh, um, uh, density fluctuations of the microwave background. And so the R question was not really, this is obviously, it's, it's a model that I worked out when I was young and was working on my PhD, but what uh, is interesting, that so the question what I have been involved lately to ask, well, that's nice once you are close to an FRW solution. But people have only always been showing, and very robustly, that the single field model is insensitive to arbitrary initial data. So what I mean arbitrary is not just perturbatively close to the FRW solution, so non-perturbatively close or far away from the FRW solution. And what we ask is, well, what would happen with this model when we try to test it? So if this is a realistic model, we should also be able to prove that arbitrary initial data drives classical, of course, here, 
because when you're in a contracting universe, you would start in large scales where uh, your initial data is really just initial data for the Einstein field equation driven by this two field uh, uh, stress energy tensor. So what you would want to see is that exactly this is the solution where you converge to. And so we do the simulation. Here I will show it to you in, this will appear soon. My, I should mention my collaborators, David Garfinkel, Franz Petoris, and Paul Steinhardt. And uh, so what you see is you want to, in the moment we uh, solve the field equations in three plus one dimensions, but we only induce <coughs> just for computational simplicity. And we have actually in the moment, or in the meantime, we're in 2D simulations. By 1D, I will mean we induce inhomogeneities and isotropies only in one spatial direction. So what I will show you first is, we start with very wide, as you can see, for example, here from the phi profile. So that should be the background field with the negative exponential. And this should be the, the, the high field that produces the mode, sees the dissipate background eventually. So we start with really large fluctuations that would not be describable as perturbatively far away around uh, or away from an FRW background. So what you see here is the x-axis. So this is the universe in a box. We have periodic boundary conditions. And what you see here is really just the field distribution and height evolves with time and the high field. Now, if I start the simulation in particular first, let's see, with the five field, what you would expect is, and the high field too, I hopefully can run them. This will be very quick. So it will be quick because what we would expect is if we start with large inhomogeneities in the high field, due to the, this uh, fake, the citadel background, it will be very quickly smoothed out, even from the non-perturbative regime, if we are right. And then let's watch. I told you it is quick. So there is nothing little numerical noise in that one. And it's still running because we need about 100 defaults of contraction. And what you see from the other field is the five field very quickly also homogenizes. And you see, this doesn't stop. Why? This field just is the high dot. So what I'm showing you here is the high field's kinetic energy. And here is just the five profile. This field is picking up more and more. Obviously, these are not for particle physics realistic values. We don't roll in reality several tens of field values or field distances. But just to you see, by uh, the five field taking more and more negative values means that it gains a homogeneous profile and at the same time keeps rolling down the potential. So far, so good. So what would you expect now? So, so far, it's completely no surprise. And what you would expect now is when you see and ask yourself, OK, I know how my scalar field behaves. I know that the high field actually freezes out. So what I would expect is now but when, I, when I ask what will dominate the background energy density, um, and here, again, I see here the universe, the spatial distribution at one moment in time. And here, what I see is a normalized energy density should sum ideally to 1. And at the end of contraction, your scalar field matter, which is here denoted in green, and uh, spatial curvature is red and shear is blue, should just freeze out, right? Because that was the idea, or the original idea of contraction, that a uh, scalar field with negative potential will quickly dominate the energy density, and all the other energy contribution just freeze out. Now, if I, if I found that already, when I run the, when I run the Einstein equations, that my scalar field's kinetic energy, the second field, is really frozen out to the modified damp here, not damping term. Now, what I would expect is that everything that adds to the background evolution is the five field. So there should be no surprises. So what you would see is, and what you would expect to know from earlier simulations, that the shear and the curvature contribution just freeze out, goes somewhere to zero. And what you would see is everything is dominated by the green curve. So. Let's run the simulation. So far, so good, right? Oops. So this is a mess. Now, of course, when I first saw this, and we all first saw it, we were very worried. This doesn't look like as it should look like. What really happens is, as you saw, so the thing pinched off. It went towards FRW curvature red and that froze out. Usually it's not there, I'm not sure. I think it's the interaction with the screen. <laughs> it's not exactly. Um, let's go back a little bit because the same result, I'm not sure what happened here. Anyways, so. By the way, is it uh, random? I mean, why did it choose those locations? Yeah, that's good. As I, I explained, this was a really other question. So what we saw first is, actually, you started to approach FRW, shear and uh, spatial curvature went to zero. And it, uh, the answer is, by the way, that it depends on the initial data. What exactly why is the approach is? But the problem is here, this is not FRW. This is something where, in a universe, there are patch where shear almost equally 
occupies in, uh, almost as much from the total energy density as um, as a scale field matter. So it's really bad. <laughs> it's not what you would have expected. So we always assume, just to wrap up, we always assume the um, the cosmology f uh, cosmological approximation on FRW background is a good one as soon as you are uh, um, because that FRW comes from the tractor solution. You can even compute it perturbatively. It's completely stable that solution. The problem, if you start close enough to FRW, the problem was here we started far enough, far away, and where it went to is is a universe at the end that even though the scalar kinetic energy doesn't contribute, it looks like that there is lots of shear in the universe. So for some reason. Um, it was not what anyone would have expected. And so the first thing what you think of is code error. Yeah, but it wasn't. So you check your, your constraints and if they are the resolution, a different resolution, and so on. So you basically check everything until you have to convince yourself that this is really the solution. And then one had to, one had to find an explanation why the dynamics drove you to a solution that wasn't what you expected. So this, this is a constant shear. And then we solve these equations using a tetrad formalism and one can, once one accepts that this is there, then one can track down that the shear component is triggered by the gradient energy of the second field. And so, but the real explanation is the following. Um, the shear is sourced by the kinetic energy of the field, oh sorry, by the gradient energy that's coupled also. So the nonlinear sigma type interaction is good to freeze out the kinetic energy, but it amplifies the shear in this model. And so the question was, is it generally the case, or is there some physical reason for it? Why? And this is also peculiar, right? Because it's a constant shear, going back to the constant gradient solution being a solution. So first, we didn't know. Naively, you never find as a cosmologist a constant gradient solution leading to shear, because you immediately assume that's not the case. And then the second thing, what we have found is, what is the reason? So there has to be a reason why it's being picked out. We do physics, so we have to understand what it is. And this is something that, um, we normally in cosmology consider as some advantage, namely the symmetry of the theory. So when I showed you the Lagrangian, it was a perfectly shift symmetric Lagrangian. So what happened is really, and this is very often in cosmology, we actually do want to write down theories that are shift symmetric because we know that they lead to scaling solutions, that we need we know that they lead to nearly scaling and spectra of perturbations, they are they lead to attractor solutions, everything what you like. The problem is that once you have two scalars, Scaling uh, shift symmetry also tells you that there is no difference between zero gradient or constant gradient solutions. And so what we, once you know this, you also know what you have to do. And this is something that I find really interesting. So I will show you our model. It's the same two field model with a small difference. Here you won't see any problem. So here you also pinch off to FRW, and curvature and, and shear becomes essentially zero in the contribution to the total energy density. <coughs> and so, given what I said, it's probably not so difficult to guess what we did. Oh, sorry. I should. Okay, that was it. So you have to break the symmetry. So you have to tell the theory, and this is very natural, right? The high field is never completely massless. So if you actually include the fact that the high field itself could have a mass, what really happens is that one can show it with calculation, but the, but the real issue is that the theory will have a um, preferred state, the constant gradient state, constant zero gradient state will be the preferred uh, configuration of this model and so you won't pick the Lagrangian that you usually pick and say oh this is the great Lagrangian because chi dot is exactly a solution and if I have no mass I also have zero non-gaussianity but that's good as long as you don't start from arbitrary initial data once you start with arbitrary initial data, you really have to give a high field of the mass that doesn't add too much to the fact that you will still have the high dot profile being zero. You will still have very small non-Gaussianity, but the fact will be that you end up with a Lagrangian that's not what you studied because you did the numerical relativity simulation. So it's, I mean, I, obviously this is not a groundbreaking result in some sense. In some sense, I do think it's very important because we see that just by doing the naive calculation that cosmologists always do, right? That we assume that the relativistic solution, when it's stable and small perturbation, it will also be driven there, starting from arbitrary initial data. Everywhere else you can assume that, but not in early universe cosmology when you actually want to show that you are relatively insensitive to a, to, to, to a wide set of initial data. And in that sense, I think it really shows that numerical relativity does add uh, to 
the cosmologist's knowledge by finding solution, by finding a real attractive solution, and eventually can also uh, improve our theory building tools. And this is where I also wrap up with being within time. Thank you. And the mass be arbitrarily small and still yeah that's symmetry. it's a very good question obviously we do the stability calculations and that tells you can find a basin of attraction so if the so mass too small you would still find a massive solution and you have to have a minimum mass that gives you a basin of attraction big enough that you can run 60 100 i don't run here now 120 right. volts uh, so that so you have really the stable the solution whenever the gradient can take over whenever you leave the basin of attraction because the mass is too small then you get back to the configuration when the field thinks that it has no mass. Yes. So this is also good because it constrains your model that you can actually generate. So we we uh, we were computing with an m square high square potential. So just something natural. So I really just wanted to give it as a small add-on to the to the thing. And because Avi is having a birthday tomorrow, I thought something that I was surprised about maybe it would surprise. So happy free birthday, Avi. <laughs> Thank you.